Okay, I think now's a great time to start. Welcome everybody, good morning and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar as part of the Humanitarian WASH Research Updates series. We are so appreciative of your participation today. My name is Autumn Ofenstein and I'm the project director under the USAID, BHA and Tufts University project incorporating research into practice who are behind this webinar series. Today, I will be moderating the discussion First, we're going to begin with some introductions and a brief overview of today's topic, which will be followed by presentations on existing research on the value of coordination in humanitarian WASH. We will have plenty of time for discussion at the end, but please feel free to post your questions into the Q&A as the presenters speak, and we will get back to them after presentations are finished. If you see somebody post a question that you also have, you'll have the option to upvote, so that question will get priority. You'll also notice at the bottom of your screen using the CC button, you have the option to turn on closed captioning. And as long as translation is enabled, you should be able to set caption language into your preferred language. Now I will turn over to Danielle, who's a professor at Tufts University, and she will give us a brief overview on existing coordination research. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It's great to be here today, and thank you for joining our webinar. Um, I'm going to give about a five-minute overview before turning over to Camille and Travis for research. Um, so just to say that we know right now that humanitarian emergencies are increasing. Across the emergency types, disasters caused by natural hazards, outbreaks, epidemics, and conflict emergencies, Across our affected populations, refugees, internally displaced persons, and entrapped persons, because of a combined set of factors, a climate change, population increases, where people live, spillover of pathogens, and as such, our, our humanitarian response needs vary across our emergency types, our populations affected, what's happening, Yet in all contexts, we need coordination to ensure response, a, a coordinated response that meets the needs of populations affected by emergencies. In my introduction, I'm going to give a little bit of history of response and coordination. And I just wanted to start going back very far in history to say that it was ICRC that was crucial in initially establishing international law naming NGO in the UN Charter, and during the Cold War, responding. And this all happened in the late 1800s through the Cold War in the 1980s. ICRC was also crucial in establishing humanitarian principles. At the end of the Cold War, there was a dividend, and there were many NGOs that started entering the aid sector. And there was a lack of accountability in these NGOs as they entered. And this lack of accountability was really highlighted during the response to the Rwanda genocide. The Rwanda genocide was in 1994. Um, it was a, a large and, and tragic genocide with 800,000 people killed in 100 days that led to 2 million refugees. Um, in the refugee camps, um, it was found aid was exacerbating conflict and there was significant deaths from poorly treated, inadequately treated cholera. That account of, with the kind of problems that were seen in the Rwanda genocide response, there was a move in the sector to accountability. And there were kind of three things that were established at that time. First, um, ICRC and NGOs together worked together to establish a code of conduct. The SPHERE standards were initially established and they maintain being updated through today. These are minimum standards and key indicators for WASH, nutrition, food provision, shelter, and health, and now include also a suite of cross-cutting issues. And then the UN and NGOs together created the cluster system. So at the time, the cluster system was envisioned as clusters that would work together under a humanitarian and emergency relief coordinator. And the clusters would, would coordinate actors across all types of actors, have meetings, information sharing, strategic response, and funding. Um, there are currently 11 clusters. Each has a host. The WASH cluster is hosted by UNICEF. 
Over time, uh, since the establishment of the cluster system, the cluster system has really evolved. Um, the transformative agenda made changes to the cluster system um, after the Haiti and Pakistan responses in 2010. Um, there's also the cluster is now considered the provider of last resort. Um, and there's six plus one core functions of the cluster system in total, not just within WASH. And these include supporting service delivery, strategic decision making, planning, advocacy, monitoring, contingency planning, and the plus one is accountability to affected populations. So over time, we've seen the cluster system evolve to meet, um, to meet needs. Now, there are also questions on the cluster system. The cluster requires significant investment across the UN and NGOs. And there's a real question of what's the theory of change for the cluster? Does the cluster meet these outcomes outputs, outcomes, and impacts. And there's also some discussion of should other mechanisms be considered? Um, there's some sense that maybe there should be more command and control structures or emergency operation centers that are required uh, top down rather than voluntary um, collaborative kind of more bottom up mechanisms. And so there's a need for research to understand the kind of value add of the cluster system itself. So Tufts has been working with, with BHA and USAID on a research to action project. One piece of that is the research webinar series. That's where we are today. And we're thrilled to have four speakers with us today on coordination and understanding research on the value of coordination, specifically in this webinar in the WASH setting, although there are 11 clusters and it's possible this could be done across other clusters as well. And so we're thrilled to have those speakers with us today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Camille Halen and Travis Yates, who have done the research on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So I'm sharing my screen for Travis to start our presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about some real-time assessment of WASH coordination in humanitarian emergencies. Um, so this research started um, back in 2018 and went through several different phases um, where the next phase led into the approach and to, into the research questions for the following phase. Um, overall, this was an effort that, to gather evidence on WASH coordination with the idea that improved coordination would lead to increased consistency and, and coverage of, of the actual needs and ultimately, hopefully a more effective response. So I'm gonna be talking about the first phase of this research. Um, and the aim of this was to identify evidence of WASH cluster coordination, and then see if there's any kind of tangible impact from the coordination itself. So how did we do this? Um, we investigated three different data sources using qualitative approaches. The literature review we included both gray and literature work, gray <coughs> and published works. And that we also identified, you know, we focused on WASH coordination, but also appreciated if there was a general um, coordination document from different sectors. Um, overall, we identified 28 documents, about half of them were from the gray lit, um, which I think was also appreciating some of the, the UN or NGO kind of documentation. Um, the second source was coming from the Global Watch Cluster, or UNICEF, and these were internal documents. Um, mostly, these were end-of-mission reports, um, which were, were coming from the field support team or other similar me mechanisms, um, which typically dealt with some kind of coordination. And then lastly, key form interviews. Um, these were targeted individuals with extensive experience in the Watch Cluster coordination, and mostly also came from current or former UNICEF staff. So the key takeaways, so we assessed and collated uh, kind of some different findings, um, but we thought was most important um, were taking the themes that were consistent across um, the three different data sources. So first off, as Daniel mentioned as well, that you know the cluster started back in 2005, 
Um, but there's been a lot of changes and improvements that have been made. There wasn't necessarily a clear alternative um, in some of the discussions, but it mostly pointed to the cluster being a best fit model, that things were going pretty good um, and they were moving in a direction that improvements were being made. Uh, one of the strongest findings that we had was staffing is critical. You know, of course, you know, finding good people is really important, but there was a realization that um, wash coordination was beyond engineering focused or a technical skill set, um, where cluster coordinators needed strong people skills. They needed to build a consensus, uh, manage meetings, um, have, and also kind of deal with diverse expectations. Um, one of the other components with that was also having a dedicated role. Um, this is compared to um, double hatting, which was necessary. So um, they couldn't kind of try to do two different things or two different roles at the same time. Um, well, the next one would be weak wider coordination. Um, also, as Danielle mentioned, WASH is only one of the 11 different clusters or sectors, um, but working between the clusters or sectors is not that easy. Um, I think from most people's perspectives that you know, we, we talk to, it seems like you know, WASH, the WASH cluster typically operates better than most other clusters. Um, but again, there were some challenges working across the different sectors. And lastly, um, we identified that there was a need for a theory of change. Um, this was a major finding from the literature review, but it came up in different ways from the other data sources. Um, for instance, recommendation that there was a need for a strategic focus or understanding the role of cluster-led tools was identified as a theme that related back to a theory of change. And with that in mind, you know, since a theory of change was clearly identified, um, we worked to create one. Um, and so this represented how regular cluster coordination and expectations would lead to impact from a coordination that was focused on working with other, uh, typically NGO partners um, and local government, but it also kind of expanded that to see how would the impact relate to the beneficiary level. I'll stop there because that's kind of part one and I'll turn it over to Camille. Thank you, Travis. So uh, the study that Travis just described concluded also with the need to include feedbacks from all relevant stakeholders and beneficiaries of the WASH coordination uh, to assess this coordination. And therefore, a few years later, we conducted the second piece of research to assess the outcomes and impacts of the WASH coordination by gathering feedback from WASH coordination platform staff and partners. And so the results of this work were also intended to validate the, the developed theory of change for WASH coordination. So we used a mixed method protocol, including interviews with um, cluster staff and collection of monthly activity reports to collect inputs and information on cluster functionality. Interviews with WASH stakeholders present in country to gather their feedback and an online survey conducted globally with anyone who self-define as involved in the response to collect additional feedback uh, with different geographic levels. So this approach was used in uh, three contexts selected to represent uh, various humanitarian situations, including Cox Bazar in Bangladesh, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Yemen. And data were collected um, three times over a nine month period to enable rich details over time. And during this period, we conducted more than 90 interviews, collected 24 activity reports, and received more than 150 surveys across the three contexts. So the results first showed that the WASH clusters met expectations as a coordinating body for more than 59% of respondents across the three contexts. Uh, additionally, more than 60% of respondents stated the cluster positively evolved, reporting there were more tools, more dynamisms, and less duplication of activities. During the interviews, um, we uh, collected information on whether respondents uh, thought cluster activities helped them or their organizations to reach specific response outcomes as detailed in the theory of change. And more than 75% of respondents in the three contexts agree to say that the cluster helped them and their organizations to make strategic decisions and to identify and reduce the gaps in the response. 
The results of this study uh, also highlighted that cluster staff and WASH stakeholders were overall aligned in their perspective of existing tools and activities, outcomes met by the cluster, and the main barriers to the WASH coordination. And lastly, uh, those results were consistent with previous work, so highlighting again the importance of the staff and uh, participation with partners. So this work validated, but also expanded the theory of change that Travis described by adding a new activity and outcomes, as you can see in red on this slide, related um, to the importance of the WASH cluster and the WASH coordination to increase partners' capacity and strengthen stakeholders' relationships. And this theory of change was used with other initiatives to review the minimum requirements, a practical framework for monitoring the core function, the humanitarian core functions, for the WASH coordination platforms at the country level. So the two first studies um, that we just described uh, highlighted that coordination platform staffing is important. However, despite UNICEF guidance on the minimum structure of coordination teams at the country level, and despite the needs for coordination on the ground, not all WASH coordination platforms are fully staffed, which has, which has likely consequences on the outcomes and impacts of the WASH coordination. And therefore, the goal of the third study was to assess the value add of WASH coordination for different staffing levels. So Central African Republic, uh, Colombia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Northeastern Nigeria, and Yemen were the five contexts selected in this study, in this third study, to account for differences in staffing levels at the time of the study, um, with high staff teams uh, in yellow, uh, as you can see on the map, to low staff uh, teams um, in red on the map. And similar context-specific evaluations to the one I presented for the second uh, study were completed. So including interviews with WASH coordination platform staffs and partners, online survey, and the completion of uh, activity report. And data were collected over a six month period and analyzed by using the theory of change and the WASH cluster minimum requirements. And during this period, we collected 31 activity reports, more than 450 surveys, and conducted 20 interviews with the cluster staff and 94 interviews with partners, including partners from local NGOs, international NGOs, uh, donors, and government officials. So the first main observation we made was that no context had the perception of having an inadequate level of staffing at the time of the study. Partners and staff in the five contexts discussed unfilled or double-hatted position and, and high turnover among the staff. Um, and despite those challenges, WASH, the WASH coordination platform staff have a set of minimum requirements to complete for effective WASH coordination that I represented here to give you an idea. And in this study, we observed that some minimum requirements were more met than others, whatever the coordination and staffing levels. And conversely, other minimum requirements were less met. And those consistent differences across contexts could be explained by a consistent gap between the staffing level and the support received and the expectations. We also observed that the completion um, of some minimum requirements depended uh, on staffing, of course. Uh, Yemen had a stable and high staffed uh, coordination platform team at the time of the study, and therefore they were able to work um, to, to develop more WASH strategies and work more on specific topics, such as WASH assessment or uh, tools for accountability to affected populations. Uh, and additionally, we, we observed other specific activities in each context, and those differences between activities and tools uh, were attributed to differences in coordination levels, but also support received and um, by the context. So in conclusion, those three studies uh, led to a deeper understanding of the value of the WASH coordination and culminated with the development of the theory of change to base a logical framework for the WASH cluster approach. Those studies also helped to inform the WASH cluster strategies, including the revision of the minimum requirements. So over the past six years, Tufts University and the Global WASH Cluster have collaborated to complete research to assess the outcomes and the impacts of the WASH coordination in emergencies. So it started by including experts' feedback on coordination, and step by step, we were able to include feedback from other relevant stakeholders and beneficiaries of the coordination. However, it's critical to assess the impact of the coordination on affected populations, who are the ultimate beneficiaries of this coordination, 
and therefore future operational research on coordination should involve um, the affected population perceptions. So I really thank you for your attention. And now I will hand over to Aliocha and Monica from the Club Wash Cluster. Thank you so much, uh, Camille. Whilst I'm sharing screen, um, I would like to thank Tufts University for, for having us on the webinar. My name is uh, Alyosha Salaniak. I work with the Global Wash Cluster as Advocacy and Knowledge Management Specialist. And uh, I will just go to presentation mode whilst I do that. Uh, we will use the first couple of slides also to uh, describe a little bit what this research also brought to us internally, uh, to the national coordination platforms, to their partners as well, but also in the way uh, we operate as a, a team that supports over 33 platforms. Uh, without further ado, I would just like to introduce uh, Monica Ramos, who's the Global Wash Cluster Coordinator, and who will take us through the intro of this presentation. Monica, over to you. Thank you so much, Aliocha. So, so great to be here with all of you today. And again, I just want to re-emphasize our great appreciation to Tufts University, um, Danielle, Camille, as well as Travis, all of the great work that we've been doing together over the years and really champions of coordination. We couldn't be where we are today as the Global Wash Cluster without key pieces of work and key supporters like you. And of course, a big thank you to all the participants online. It's really great to see so many um, familiar names, these people, I would love to know who they are in the future and to see that there is such a great interest in better understanding the value of coordination. So just quickly, uh, just to give a ground a little bit, the Global Wash Cluster, and I know, Danielle, you touched upon this. Currently, we have 90 global members, so we are a global multi-stakeholder platform. Members are coming from international and national NGOs. They're also coming from donor communities, academia, uh, the UN agencies. So we have a large scope of um, type of partners, which really, I think, brings the richness to the Global Wash Cluster because we can then cover quite a broad range of a variety of topics. We do have over a, a 100, uh, sorry, 1,100 humanitarian partners in the field. So across the 33 countries that Aliocha mentioned, where we have coordinated appeals, we have uh, coordination, national coordination platforms in place. We're working there. You can see on the map uh, the, the spread, the geographical spread, where we're pretty much on every continent. Um, we are mandated by the Interagency Standing Committee. So we were established in 2005. We are led by UNICEF, so we're hosted. We're one of the uh, three clusters as well as AOR hosted inside of UNICEF. So actually UNICEF is the largest cluster lead agency. We provide direct support to the national cluster platforms. We also look at localized coordination and really we drive forward the thought leadership and accountability to coordinate large uh, humanitarian operations for the WASH sector. Next slide, please, Aliocha. Thank you. So just to give a visualize 90 members <laughs> and growing, um, we do, as I said, have such a broad range of, of great partners and we're able to do a lot of really good work because of the diversity of the profile of the various partners. So we really do thank those of you who are our members at the global level. We know that this also is replicated and in the countries with our national coordination platform. So it's really great to see the, the scope that we have and all of the support that we have from the various partners. Over to you, Aliocha, for the next slide. Or uh, I'm on this one, yes. Um, so I think Danielle will touch upon it a bit as well as Kenny um, in their introductions and Aliocha will do a bit of a, a deep dive. But every year we we are mandated by the Interagency Standing Committee to uh, do the what we call CCPM, which is the Cluster Coordination Performance Monitoring. So for those of you that are part of national coordination platforms, you likely have been requested in the past to fill out questionnaires, come to a workshop, and really give a score or a rating of how well the coordination team has performed over that particular year across the six plus one core functions, which are those that are, are listed there. Um, we then put that all together, and this is a visual of how well we are uh, achieving the various core functions across our 33 platforms. Uh, we do see uh, service delivery usually being quite high. We do tend to see advocacy being on the lower end, preparedness on the lower end. Uh, these results seem pretty consistent with what we've seen in recent years. And we actually really do use this information to then plan the operational support that we provide from the global level to the various countries and really work with the platforms to ensure that they are able to really hone in on uh, what is required to deliver to a satisfactory level the core function. So to complement that, 
We actually launched a process a few years ago, which we refer to as the minimum requirements, where we really wanted to also give the coordination teams the opportunity to do a bit of an auto evaluation as well. I mean, it's great to get that global score from the various partners that are working with you um, on the ground, but as a coordination team, it's also a good time to reflect really on how well you feel as a team you've been able to deliver across the different core functions. So that's a tool that's gone through quite a few different revisions. Uh, we are currently actually in the moment where we're rolling out the CPTM and the team has just launched into the minimum requirements. So the team sits with the national coordination team from a particular country. We walk through a bit of a deep dive across the various coordination functions. We really try to tease out uh, what's going well, what is not going well, what needs to be improved, and what support can we as the global uh, WASH cluster, as the, the CAS, the, the cluster advocacy and support team, do to help the team, the, the team in country uh, through the next year cycle of uh, delivering upon the core functions. So it's really just a accountability, it's a monitoring mechanism, but it's also a bit of accountability mechanism as well to make sure that we're keeping ourselves really up to date uh, and honest about what's going well, but more importantly, what's not going well and being really pragmatic about what we can do to hone in on that, fix that, and really reinforce and enhance that particular, um, the, the way that we, we deliver upon that for function. So this is just a bit of an overview there, which then I will now hand over to Alia to deep dive into how we're putting the various uh, research around all of this into action. Thank you, over to you, Alyosha. Thank you, Monica. Um, yes, yeah, so a bit, uh, a bit to give the the other side of the story because we've seen, I think, so far, uh, what the research uh, has been about and how Tufts University also in the whole process uh, has been supporting, uh, you know, this this whole idea around finding the impacts of coordination at various levels. Um, one thing we would like to uh, to to really uh, hone in on is 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 also how does research what does it provide to national platforms and how uh, do academics or networks uh, can tag along those research networks that we've seen really I would say mushrooming but really growing over the past years in in a couple of key contexts. One thing we wanted to to also say is that this research really helped. Uh, the overall cluster in 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 providing better staffing to those national coordination platforms. Uh, Ten years ago, only twenty to thirty percent of the national platforms had dedicated staff, uh, which made it very complicated for any coordinators to engage into something that went beyond just supporting service delivery, uh, core uh, coordination functions, and research and honing on on the networks, the academic, uh, uh, um, I would say, field was mainly not their priority during that time, especially when we look at the low staffing, which uh, uh, increased uh, 10 years uh, from 10 years from now. So as of today, we can we can also happily, uh, um, you know, hone in on this success that 72 percent are now staffed with dedicated coordinators. So we're talking full time staff, usually sitting with UNICEF often co-coordinating with another INGO and being led uh, wherever relevant and possible by the government. So uh, this has also set up an environment that really uh, led to some entry points for research to really uh, uh, support coordination uh, and vice versa. So staffing, we've really seen that it's been keen to uh, coordination in research. Just think in terms of knowledge management. When you're coordinating a sector with over, uh, uh, you know, ninety partners, sometimes there's a lot of knowledge that is being shared. You would ensure that a regular staffing can basically also uh, uh, confirm that in the longer term. Uh, just ensuring that the institutional institutionalization of, uh, you know, technical standards, designs that have been developed jointly over the years would basically remain somewhere. And this somewhere has been strengthened uh, thanks to this, uh, the, the staffing and also the efforts made within UNICEF to provide dedicated staff. Um, so a lot of this research also helped us advocate for staffing um, and, and, and support national coordination platforms in realizing uh, how much academia could do also at local level as a key ally, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, technical working groups in terms of, of data collection, as well as other uh, uh, key, uh, I would say, tasks that coordinators were, oh, 
you know, two, three years ago, we're starting to see really the added value and would engage more on a systematic basis with academics on the ground beyond just humanitarian partners. Um, so yeah, a, a local and international, uh, I've written it here because it's also how can we leverage networks of local academic uh, academics, uh, obviously. That was a key ask from national coordinators and national coordination platforms over the years to be supported on that and to be able to uh, voice that uh, to the, at the global level as well. Then in terms of knowledge management, a lot of uh, research uh, opportunities and uh, um, I would say uh, initiatives have been launched over the past years, uh, which have been also uh, uh, key to, to clusters and national coordination platforms. Uh, the research uh, uh, agenda 2030 by the London School, uh, where the Global Watch Cluster along with national platforms have been heavily involved. We've also seen an increasing involvement of national coordination teams in those big research projects, meaning uh, ensuring that the collective, the local partners would be represented in, in such global level agenda uh, initiatives. Um, this uh, particular collaboration, the fact that we're here all today, is uh, also due to this uh, um, uh, Tufts and, and, and BHA and GWC research to practice project. Uh, and, and so this is made possible thanks to those kind of, of initiatives uh, that can also look at a collective uh, research agenda uh, uh, for, for the WASH sector. The impact of coordination has been a bit assets in terms of research uh, coming into the world of the Global Wash Cluster, as described uh, very well by Travis and Camille beforehand. Uh, the gap analysis is also something where we've seen uh, heightened engagement from National Coordination Platform uh, about two, two, three years ago, I believe, uh, has highlighted also uh, a lot of uh, involvements from the local level, uh, but as well has been has increased the participation of national platforms. So those were really key research that um, uh, that were used that were also helpful to raise the voice of coordination and of collective action. Locally, we've seen also very interesting projects uh, going on around involving research actors into the fecal sludge management from the very first start of uh, the uh, Rohingya crisis. Uh, uh, I remember also being deployed there and even when there were talks around the allocation of land for fecal sludge management, uh, there were strong academic partners uh, uh, able also at national level but internationally to provide, collect the evidence around uh, around the importance of, of, of that matter and to advocate for it very, very clearly. Palestine, we've seen also a lot of projects, uh, one or two over the year being long-term in terms of Washington Health and where local academia had also more responsibility in terms of data collection across sectors, which made it very beneficial for, for both clusters uh, that sometimes have uh, uh, challenges to collaborate uh, and, and and we're trying also with joint operational frameworks to, to fill that gap, but we've seen also a very good uh, examples there. And I will end with uh, the several coordination mechanisms that have been also seeking for academia and uh, research support from the regional level on monitoring, water point mapping, uh, also working with sometimes, uh, you know, private companies and academia jointly to uh, look at uh, uh, collective water mapping, but also capacity strengthening within governments to ensure that monitoring systems would not only speak to the humanitarian world, but also more to the development databases and so on. So a couple of examples over the years that I think have shown quite some success. I will um, end up shortly with, with one slide in terms of uh, entry points for researchers into uh, the world of the cluster. I'm, I'm depicting here uh, uh, the cycle of the humanitarian program, which is a run in majorly, I would say 90% of the countries that have been mentioned beforehand. Those are protracted crises where there's a regular humanitarian strategic planning cycle that runs from January to December. There are key entry points for academia that we've witnessed over the years uh, across uh, key phases of this cycle that are mostly around uh, needs assessments, uh, strategic planning, as well as response monitoring. 
uh, those were uh, mostly where demands were created or linkages were created uh, to leverage some of the, uh, the the academia, some of the methodologies that that were available in country uh, as well. So um, in terms of needs assessments, really been around data collection, supporting the multi-sector uh, needs assessments analysis, mainly around analysis was also one of the areas where we've seen gaps. In terms of strategic planning, uh, a lot of the clusters operate with working groups, technical working groups that will eventually supplement just the humanitarian response planning, but will look more at the WASH technical components. What are the designs, the standards? How can we uh, uh, make sure that is translated into local language that speaks to government standards and so on? It was also very important and one uh, key entry point. Monitoring is mentioned throughout, uh, and it's not just response monitoring, but it's to make sure that the coordination teams can also use the appropriate methodologies, uh, the relevant data, uh, and, and, and help partners and other stakeholders to make informed based uh, decision making. Uh, this was also one of the other areas. So yes, on the side, you could see technical working groups. Uh, how can we, uh, coordinators also asked, how can they be supported to, to look at research gaps uh, in terms of humanitarian wash at a certain point of time uh, throughout the year. Um, how can we get better at adv advocacy, uh, which needs to be more evidence-based? This has been um, again and again repeated over many and many contexts, and we've seen uh, that improve a bit over the years, but it's really somewhere where, where we would need that kind of support in the evidence generation uh, uh, and as well as uh, as the gap of, of, of evidence. Technical support, I've, I've mentioned it. Uh, there could be quick works in terms of reviewing all sorts of national technical designs where nobody really in country has the time to do that or the brain space. This is also somewhere where they, they, there were requests made in the past. And finally, all of that cycle uh, needs to prove its efficiency or it needs to look at lessons learned. We often as humanitarians and coordinators have the time to look at operational peer review, lessons learned and, and, and the appropriate uh, uh, um, monitoring uh, across that. So a couple of key messages to researchers. Um, this is, uh, we did this uh, about, uh, I think two months ago with, with Elra as well, is how could, uh, you know, research academia and, and, and further actors try to look at simplifying research outputs and learning. This was really one of the things that was voiced uh, by, by uh, the national platforms, how to provide simple decision-making tools, how to provide evidence-based advocacy products were two of the key themes where they could see that, you know, not only are there low hanging fruits, but also key expertise that could be leveraged uh, within the academia world. Um, outputs need to be put into practice quickly. Uh, this is somewhere where coordinators are, are looking at turning papers into advocacy products, into, uh, you know, basically program documents that are easy to adapt and easy to put in place. It needs to be set in local languages with local acceptance uh, of, you know, the ways to share knowledge shouldn't only be in a local language. This was mentioned several times and uh, it should be there to change practices. This is also something that uh, often uh, we've, we've heard quite a lot. So I'll stop there with, uh, with the messages and uh, the overview. And uh, I would like to, again, thank you all for, for listening in. We're available for questions. And I'll hand it back to uh, Daniele and Autumn for the rest of the webinar. Over. Thank you so much to all our presenters. This is a fantastic uh, conversation and information presented on uh, research to action as an example. And I really want to appreciate. Um, we, um, we have a couple questions in the chat, in the Q&A box, and I want to encourage everyone to please feel free um, to kind of answer questions in the in the Q and A via text by typing. Does anybody um, want to answer any of the questions that have come up verbally on the call? If not, I have a couple questions. Um, if... Yeah. Okay. So I think um, I have two general questions I would love the panel just to address. And the first is one of the things we've seen consistently in the research is that people say the cluster adds value. 
And I remember there's one quotation in it all, it, like without the cluster, it would be chaos. But the question is the counterfactual and there is some pressure I'm seeing particularly in outbreaks and epidemics to not use the cluster system, but instead use a, a command and control top-down emergency operations center, right? And so thinking about the differences between the cluster, a kind of collaborative um, non-required versus a more top-down EOC, um, do people have anything they might want to say about the value of the cluster in that uh, as compared to alternatives? Monica, exactly. So we're not mandated in those situations. It's WHO. So very similar to a refugee crisis when you dig into the different reference modules, which basically guide us um, in, and give us the, the mandate to respond in particular types of crisis. When it does become a declared public health emergency, it is WHO who is in the lead of coordinating the overall response. And they usually do do that through technical line ministries, through things like EOCs. Now, what we can do is come in and provide that uh, specific support since we know WASH it would be a huge component of the response. And that's where we'll work really closely with the global health um, cluster, as well as a lot of times the colleagues that are working on um, RCCE, so the risk communication and, and community engagement. So it, 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 um, I don't want to make it seem like there's some sort of major legal framework, but it is a little bit of a legality issue in terms of that. And equally, maybe just to address the refugee bit. So when there is a refugee crisis, there is a reference module um, and that puts UNHCR in the lead. However, we do provide support. So we have um, provided support where we uh, will maybe have a, a refugee crisis chat could be a very good example, right? We have a refugee crisis happening. We have a cluster coordination team that's already activated. Those, those were working very fluently with each other. Lebanon's been one of that longstanding example. Many of you may be aware we have a, an annual humanitarian um, response plan. There's also a, a regional response plan. There's also a refugee response plan. And our coordination teams are working um, with the various interlocutors to make sure that um, we stay within the, what we're mandated to do by the Interagency Standing Committee, but yet we, but, but in the most collaborative way possible. So I hope that I answered the question. I didn't mean to cut the conversation. It's just that it's, it's kind of already a, a, something that's been decided, um, you know, it, it, within the UN architecture. Yeah, thanks. Adiocha, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Sorry. Well, no, I think, I, I think that, others. thank you for that summary, because I think it's something people really need to understand. And I'll turn it over to Travis. Yeah, no, thanks. I think just to kind of build upon that, like, I think there is an interesting, you know, the coordination platform is voluntary. It is one of those things that it, but it's made up of the partners. And so I think having that is, you know, like there's a lot, I would say some people would say there's not as much bite as saying like participation is voluntary and alignment with the expectations of if there's a cluster strategy, like it's kind of expected that partners would align with that. That's not always the case. Um, and so there's, that's a weakness in some ways but I think that also creates opportunity to have a discussion with the, the cluster, with the cluster coordinator to say like, hey, this isn't relevant to what I'm doing or this, I'm seeing something else in my specific area. Um, and so we need to either adjust or acknowledge that it might not be fully comprehensible. Um, that compared to, I think if it's a top-down structure where it is command and control, that conversation I think goes away. Um, and so that's where I think you know, the cluster system, I think, is not perfect by any means, but I think that's where having that voluntary interaction um, does allow for, I think, a better response that is maybe more contextual. Um, and it's not always nice whenever things are a little bit different across different platforms, but I think we have to appreciate that the contexts are different, the needs are different. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, something that we have to accept and be willing to adapt over. No, thank you for that. Um, in looking at the Q&A questions, I just um, wanted to highlight Brian's first question about saying in his research, he's has seen that coordination capacity has made progress. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for that, because I, I think we have made progress. And, and the question is what to do to do next. And so that um, 
I wanted to come to Julianne's question, um, which is about considering clusters appear to be severely understaffed, right? How much capacity is there to locally support research and how can that best be conducted in a meaningful collaborative way without burdening cluster staff? And so maybe, um, I don't know who would like to jump in first on that, maybe. Aliocha? Of course. Um, no, thanks Thanks for this. It's true that uh, we've seen that it's still quite a bit of a burden for, for cluster coordinators and cluster coordination teams when, when it's staffed. But uh, pointing it back, I think, to the, to the entry points, those were entry points because they have they have been made entry points because those were also requests from coordinators, opportunities to engage with local ac academia at a very specific point in time. Um, I can relate back to the uh, fecal sludge management kind of discussions and the way the technical working group was also set up to say that, no, the coordinator did not have a lot of time to set the things well, to develop things further, but to set things up uh, is often sometimes where where the coordinator would ensure that, uh, you know, they would speak to the national level academic uh, network. So that was done uh, at the DACA level first. And then in Cox's Bazaar, there's a, a lot of workforce uh, available, a lot of experts also um, uh, around the academia that were first of all um, um, gathered you know through a first technical working group uh, meeting a very uh, chaotic a lot of actors in the room but basically the humanitarian actors came together under the the coordination team uh, and and meeting the uh, academics that were available uh, reach at that time was doing an infrastructure um, uh, monitoring of all of the Washington infrastructures in, in Kutupalong in the main camp in Cox's Bazaar. Uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, also the local academia uh, and the network that was available uh, to do data collection was also uh, leveraged at that point. So those were two key moments where uh, the cluster coordination team did initiate the working group and then it went by its own uh, because technical experts were leading it. Eventually, they also had a coordinator, a dedicated uh, coordination, maybe not dedicated, half-time coordination person doing fecal sludge management and really uh, following up with those uh, local academic institutions. So I would say it's, it's a lot based on opportunities on those technical working groups, I think that are key entry points. And then it's quite, I would say it's quite easy. Usually uh, national coordination platforms would have a partner briefing package. So academics get to their website, get to know their partner briefing package and, and engage into a meeting. Usually coordinators would have uh, a sort of a weekly availability and schedule to brief partners, including academic ones on what the gaps are, what do they feel the gaps are, or what gaps should be identified. And often those are the types of discussion that they would engage with. So I would say, know your humanitarian program cycle, this cycle that is uh, basically dictating, to be a bit blunt, the work often of the national coordinators to know when to plug into key discussions around monitoring, around assessments, around technical working groups, and so on. Exactly, and that's research as collaboration where both sides are feeding into it. I don't know, Camille and Travis, as researchers, do you want to talk about things that have made working with the cluster easier? Or yes, I can. I can start. Um, so, of course, uh, doing research uh, may uh, overburden partners and staff. So we try to do this research in the most, uh, you know, um, in the best way possible to make sure that uh, we didn't take all the time. So uh, what we try to, to do is to, to make sure that the tools were useful both for research and for the coordination platform. So just to give you an example, uh, at that time, um, in one context, they were trying to understand which tools, information management tools, the, um, the partners wanted to develop. Um, and so this is the, this, the kind of question we also asked during the, the study. And so uh, there the, the were convergences um, between the studies and uh, what the you know, information needed by the cluster staff. And so I think it's critical to make sure that the tools we use uh, in the research um, are also useful for the cluster staff, um, you know, um, if they want specific information. Um, in the future or, or current information. So 
Um, yes, so that's what I wanted to uh, to add. Travis, I don't know if you want to add something. If yeah, just a, a really quick comment with, with that. I think, I mean, definitely part of the research and talking about the, the tools and the documents that are produced. I think when we kind of went through the list, like there was a, a large number of documents and expectations that the cluster coordinator and information management or mission manager would be um, expected to do. And I think depending on the phase of, um, of the emergency, like there was more opportunity or more experience there. But one of the, the questions that we had was, what are those tools, you know, are they available, but then are they useful? And like, are you using them? And I think kind of understanding, you know, what partners seek out more than others I mean, some things are necessary within the program cycle for funding for UNICEF and for the, the, the cluster as a whole, but maybe aren't as necessarily as um, partner focused. So there's, but there's a need for, for both, but understanding, you know, who's using what um, and, you know, what's the most valuable for the different parties is really, I think, important kind of something to understand and un unpack more. Over. Exactly. And I think one thing that I'll add to that before turning to the last question and then ending the webinar is um, is that dedicated staffing and funding for the research itself is as needed as anything else. Um, this Because asking people to do things for you unfunded is, is a burden. And so it's needed to have the staffing for the research itself as well. The last question is um, from Jacob, and I think it's a great question to end the webinar in, um, which is if people could go through and think of some potential future research directions they're excited to look at um, locally, internationally. I don't know who wants to start and jump in. Aliocha. Yeah, sure, I'll try to be short. I'm sure there's plenty of ideas. Um, no, Camille was mentioning, I think also uh, that question that we all ask ourselves, the link with, the linkages between I mean, all, all of us at least, uh, the linkages between coordination and affected populations. Uh, we talk more and more about, you know, um, improving feedback and complaints mechanism, but also localization and how could we ensure that, you know, even coordination is kind of people-centered uh, is, is a big ask. Um, I think that's one of the areas uh, definitely to be uh, to be looked at. It's also to look at the return on investment of coordination. It's something we hear more and more from their stakeholders, decision makers. We have to prove that coordination is efficient. So the cost, the actual cost of not doing coordination would take it also to another level, potentially to look at uh, uh, yeah, things such as re return on investments or financial uh, analysis and more, more detailed ones, to name a few. Over. Fantastic. Others, Tra uh, Travis, Camille, research you're excited about? I'll chime in and say I'm a little bit, a few years removed from some of the current stuff, so I don't want to claim something that might be already be happening. But um, I think one of the things that I think from just research in general and just knowing that this is really, you know, it's, it's management and operational and like, you're also dealing with really difficult contexts and a lot of pressure to kind of get results and get projects moving. Um, I think some of the findings that we had, you know, where like there are opportunities to make changes and make improvements. Um, I think that is being done over at the large, you know, like the big picture kind of scale. Um, I think, you know, looking at like what Aliocha presented or Monica with you know, the, the annual kind of review of, you know, where the cluster has been successful or like what's been going well versus not like seeing the, the, the timing, you know, like how, how quickly can we make changes if we identify areas that are, you know, not performing as well, um, how quickly can we turn that around? Um, I think that would be something to, to improve. And I think we all know that there's improvements to, to be made. Um, and so I think identifying or using, I think Elio Chua also mentioned, you know, like, using what we find, you know, using those learnings, like how can we apply them? Because um, I think oftentimes we kind of rolled into the, the next year or the next phase without really stopping to make changes. We just kind of, can, oh, we did that research. We acknowledge that there's some you know, findings and then kind of move past that. Um, and so making sure that we're adapting 
the, the results into our you know act, act, activities is really quite important. And that's something from personally, like, I find that I'm not sure how quickly we're, we're doing that or uh, if we can improve it, I think that would be great. Over. Yeah. Any last words, Camille or Monica? Maybe just to come in and yeah, on top of this point, we are constantly trying to get better. And with all of you, we are. So just a really big thanks to all of those that support us uh, globally as partners, as well as those working uh, across with us in the national coordination platforms. We need you. We need you to keep us accountable and to keep us on track and to make sure that we are really um, delivering what we should be across those core functions. And I believe it was said earlier, you are what makes coordination. So we help guide a process. We help uh, bring different stakeholders, stakeholders together, but without all of your contributions, um, you know, we, we just wouldn't be where we are today. So just a big thanks, and, and please do continue to stay engaged with us, either at the country level or at the global level, and we're just really happy to have been involved in this webinar today. Thanks, Danielle. Over to you. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to all our presenters today and for all the audience for being here. Um, that was a fantastic note to end on. And just to say, if you're interested in connecting with a national uh, cluster platform, a uh, co national coordination platform, please feel free to reach out and we can connect you locally for research. Um, I think there's a lot of exciting, I'm excited for more research done locally between national coordination platforms and local researchers. And um, I will turn it over lastly, um, after a big thank you to our presenters, to Autumn to talk about our YouTube channel and where this will be uploaded in the future. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you again, everybody for joining. Those speeches were great. Thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, as Danielle said, um, we did do a little bit of rebranding. So be on the lookout in the next coming days for a link to our new YouTube channel. Um, you'll be able to catch up on old webinars if you missed them and be on the lookout for invites for things in the future. So thank you so much, everyone, and um, have a good afternoon, evening, or late morning. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. All the best. Bye-bye.